Hello and welcome to season three, episode five of Dualist Unity. I am existence, but we'll be playing the part of Andrew today simply for convenience sake. Likewise, I will continue to play the part of Ray because everybody knows me as that and I have not switched it over to the Andrew and Carl show as yet. Anyway, um, we are very excited today to have somebody join us. Jenny Johnson, uh, you will find her on TikTok as The Jenny Johnson. You can find her at thejennyjohnson.com. She's a writer, a creator, uh, the host of the Cageless podcast, which is fantastic. I definitely do recommend that you go and check that out. Um, everything that I get from Jenny is that she is authentically just trying to figure out how to be herself and enjoy that and, and go through the challenges in a world that doesn't necessarily make that easy or where we're surrounded by people who know what that means. And so her content is all very much in that vein, which is why we brought her onto the podcast today, because that's what we're talking about all the time in getting away from our idea of ourself. So we're going to go on to Jenny in a second. I just wanted to mention to everybody again that we are in this year's People's Choice Podcast Awards. If you would like to help us out, just go to dualisticunity.com, click on vote at the top of the screen. It's absolutely free. It takes about five minutes and we're in the People's Choice Award category and the Religion and Spirituality category. So that would be very, very helpful for us. Um, lastly, of course, we have a new affiliate program. Everybody in our community has been so helpful in spreading the word that we want to give a little bit back. And so what we've done is we've made a program that if you sign up and you send somebody to our podcast and over the course of the next year, they buy one of our workshops, you get 50% of that commission from that sale. The rest of which might go to somebody who referred you to the affiliate program, or it goes towards more marketing and initiatives for dualistic unity, such as the retreat that's coming up in November, the billboard that we have planned, the previous video with Tommy Chong. And so all of this is super helpful to the community. And so that is now available. Now that I've rambled, I will go back to the show. Jenny, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, why don't you tell our audience a little bit about yourself, how you ended up on this path and some of the things that you're going through right now in terms of uh, your podcast, which is, of course, as I said, very, very good. And I believe you mentioned that you are currently in the middle of publishing a book. Yes. Well, hi, Ray and Andrew. I'm so excited to be here and and thanks for having me on. Uh, so yeah, I am I consider myself, even though I really hate labels, uh, a writer, a creator of sorts, um, really just trying to figure things out out loud. So I do, I have a podcast, uh, about experiential wisdom and personal hope from, from people that, uh, I consider experts, thought leaders, and also my friends, which can synonymous synonymously be both. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, kind of currently my, my career deal, but in terms of like spirituality and like, and being, I would say right now I am currently at a really interesting intersection of, you know, I think a lot of 26 year olds would probably identify with that as well of trying to figure out who you are in the midst of a, a cultural renaissance of sorts, along with a, uh, oncoming recession and, <laughs> and a lot of other things going on in the world. So just trying to think out loud and, and hopefully, you know, other people are thinking the same thoughts and we can kind of all think them and, and mull over them together just happens to be, you know, on the internet. Yeah. That's awesome. That's actually, that's actually one of the things I had written down that I, a theme that I noticed listening to your podcast, listening to your TikToks was the idea of, of talking about, I think it's in your bio heal loudly. I really like that because I think our society is, is sort of conditioned into suppressing what we're going through, how we're feeling. And a lot of times, whether it's pushed on us from someone outside of us, someone close to us or, or within ourselves, we just don't feel like we can express that because we might be judged or we might be looked down upon, or we might be thought of as less because of that. But what I've found, at least in my own life, because I used to think that way and now I don't, I'm pretty open about things. I talk about stuff. I'm openly willing to discuss things. And I've found that as humans, as a society, as a, as a race, we're really not so different. And anything I share really is just something that has helped me with, you know, going through all the things in life, you know, all the, all the emotions, the ups and, and the downs. And I found that a lot of people happen to resonate with that. So, and it, I think it goes along very well with, you know, being your most authentic self is just not having that hesitation to be open and, and be vulnerable and, and share your struggles and, and things that you're going through. So 
with that being said, was there a point that you weren't doing that? And was there like a realization that you had where like, why am I not doing this? Why am I keeping this all bottled up? Like I should share more, blah, blah, blah. Was there like a moment in your life that you experienced it where there, you know, I'm sure there was, you know, steps like anything, sort of a journey, but I'd love to hear just about if there was a shift or how that process has looked for you and, and the benefits you've seen since opening up more. Yeah, absolutely. I think there was for sure a shift. Uh, I mean, like a lot of us, the pandemic kind of put a lot of things into perspective and and changed the way that I think we wanted to communicate and the things that we wanted out of life. So I, I would say uh, I was very sick a couple of years ago and it, it got to the point where it was like, I can either talk about this or I can pretend like it didn't happen. And I believe that it's, it's an Elizabeth Gilbert quote, uh, that goes, the truth has legs. And so I'm for sure a person that's always like the best way out is through, because if you don't go through it now, you're going to have to go through it later, or the universe is going to give you the same lesson until you learn it. So it's like, you might as well just freaking do it, do it the hard way. Um, so in terms of healing that that's, that's kind of, uh, I guess the perspective shift that I had was kind of like, I, I don't want anyone else to be sick in the same way that I was sick. Uh, not just physically, but like mentally, emotionally, spiritually. I also used to work in a, um, in a religious institution and there came a point where I, uh, <laughs> there was a lot of like racial injustice happening within this institution and even though I am a self-identifying cisgendered straight white woman, uh, there was just something in me that that really was like, I, I'm not going to fuck with this. Like, I'm not going to condone this or be a part of an institution that that propels the problem that I'm that I stand against. And so that that was also kind of a a, a, de a definite shift for me was realizing, like, if if I'm not free, no one else is free. Like we, we all have to be free together and I want to be free and I know you want to be free. And so why are we being so quiet about it? Like, I think that the best way, best way to be free is to talk about things. So that's kind of, I guess that's kind of, uh, a spark notes of, of what has happened thus far. <laughs> that's amazing. I love that. And unfortunately, if you want to be free, more than likely you're going to upset people who want to be comfortable. That's because right. You can't have both, right? Freedom isn't comfortable. Freedom is uncertain, right? Having limitless potential is uncertain. That's the yeah. whole point, right? Is you can go in any direction you want. If it was certain, it wouldn't be limitless. Right. And That's so I find so right. it very, very interesting that on your website, because you mentioned religion. So as far as I'm concerned, it's fair game now. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> on your website, it says an apprentice of Jesus, mm -hmm. which I love. I think that's fantastic because I was raised Roman Catholic. I am about as far from Roman Catholic now as I, as you can possibly get, but Jesus, or Yeshua, whatever you want to call him is a huge figure in, in terms of things that make you go, Hmm, because there's a lot that that person said that really isn't very far off from the things that we're talking about right now. It's just taken a little bit further. Yeah. I would also say that it, it has been, uh, put through the lens of a lot of men, <laughs> a lot of human men that uh, have spoken on behalf of like the divine being that we call higher power. So can we, I think can we say egotistical men? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I mean, especially in the Roman Catholic church, but I don't know if I'm allowed to, say, I can say what I want. I, yeah, I definitely think that that religion itself has harmed so many people, but religion is also not Jesus. Like religion is not uh, a set of, you know, religion is a set of practices and a set of rules when spirituality is much more on the side of spirit, you know, much more on the side of relationship. And I think that we are just now as a society getting to a point where we can recognize like, oh, I don't have to not lie or be gay to like be loved by the, by, by a higher power, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Well, and this is goes back to something else that you were saying that, that God is love and that if you had a mission or if, if you, there was a point to what you were doing, I don't remember which episode you were saying this in, but it was to be the most undiluted version 
of yourself mm-hmm. to be most in line with God or most in line with love as, yeah. as it were. And everything that we talk about on this podcast is, is about the realization of that alignment or, or the, uh, the practice of that alignment and the recognition that the barrier to that alignment is mm-hmm. always identity. It's always what we think of ourselves, because as soon as we think of ourselves, it's like you were saying, you know, religion is not Jesus. The idea of God is not God. The idea of ourselves yeah. is not ourself. Right. And as soon as we get caught in it, we're no longer aligned with what is. We're no longer the awareness of the universe, or at least we're no longer embodying that. Now we're living in this tiny, tiny little box. And, yeah. and we're, our whole experience is based on that little box. And because it's disconnected, we fear and we compete and we compare and we do all of this stuff. And so I find so much of what you're saying is in line with what we've been talking about on here that we had to have you on the show because Mm -hmm. our our point is very much that jesus would have never condoned christianity religion itself does the very opposite of what it's supposed to do which is to bind us together because religion as an identity is divisive Mm -hmm. the truth is what is Right? The only true religion is none, because that's what, what binds us together. That's the one thing we can all relate on. So I just love the fact that what you're saying is, get out of the way, be yourself, speak loudly, right? Let the world yeah. and their expectations be damned. And that's yeah. exactly what every single person who's ever recognized unity does on right. any level whatsoever, because they recognize that's the priority, not, not my yeah. petty feelings, but my effect on the whole. So yeah. I, I just want to say th- again, thank you for being here. Oh my gosh. Well, yeah, thank you. I think you brought up a a lot of really great points and Jesus would have (laughs) flipped a lot of tables, I think, in the Western church, uh, many more than he would have sat at. So from a, from a personal perspective, like I said, working in the institution, I, I don't identify with any denomination now. Uh, That's why I consider myself an apprentice of Jesus uh, not even like a follower of Jesus. He's just my, he's my teacher. Like he's my rabbi, you know, he's, he's my savior and like higher being. And with that comes, you know, whether you follow the Bible or the Quran or, or, you know, whatever, you know, physical embodiment that's here on earth of your religious practices, you know, I believe that like perfect love cast out fear. And so much of the religion that I was raised in and the religion that has been embedded into me. And I think our society in general is just like, you are inherently bad and you need to be made good. Like you need to do things to make you good. And I don't think that the universe can operate on that type of inauthenticity, if you will, or at least I haven't found it that way. My life has gotten significantly better when I've started to treat myself as the friend that I believe you know, Jesus treats, treats me as, um, and that, that also comes to like learning how to rewire your brain, learning how to talk to yourself differently, you know, whether that's from other teachers that you've been taught, whether that is the voice of your parents in your head, whether that's the voice of an old coach or like, but you were never bad. You were never born like bad, you know, because otherwise I don't think that you would be born out of love. So that's an entirely that that that's a rabbit hole for sure. Yeah, no, I, I think the thing with with the Bible that people miss who maybe they're super anti Bible and religion or like super even people who are super pro, like a lot of them don't even fully read it or recognize what's being said. And there's so many parts of it, and especially mm-hmm. you know, Gospel of Thomas, which was left out of of the current Bible in its current form. Like mm-hmm. there's so many amazing nuggets because it's quotes from Jesus. It's what he actually said, as opposed to an egotistical interpretation of yeah. what he said. And I really liked what you're talking about with, with the idea. I kind of think of it as, or call it like unlearning and all of yeah. those practices that you were, you were taught when you were growing up, even, even the belief that because of original sin, you were born into this world unworthy and only, you know, finding God or only like Jesus is the only thing that can, you know, make you worthy. And as long as you just, you know, listen to what our interpretation of what he says was, which was interpreted through mostly men who wanted to manipulate and control humanity in a kind of fucked up way. And for a very long time, like that's who we're, we're working with here. And so it's like, 
being a good person in their eyes, like, what does that really look like? And if you're, if you're seeing people and, and you look into the history a bit and it's like, so we're following, we're trying to be good people based on the perception of people who burn people at the stake, who don't agree with what they say, you know, think being gay is, is like a mortal sin and you're just going to burn in hell because you were born that way. It's like, in mm-hmm. insanity when you when you look at it from like a, a higher point of view like this is madness that's that's happening that people are just yeah. willingly buying into out of out of fear out of purely out of fear of uncertainty mm-hmm. and a lot of it has to do with you know because we don't understand the afterlife or really haven't gone within ourselves enough we stay so surface level and get so caught up in the in the shallow end that we can't recognize maybe some of the deeper truths of this reality. And we're mm-hmm. so caught up in, in the shallowness of it, that it gets in the way of those things. But yeah, unlearning, I think has been one of the most helpful things. And I, when I do, you know, like client calls or one-on-one stuff like that, and people ask at the end, like, what, what are some book recommendations? And I was like, I always say like, yeah, I'll give them a couple things maybe, but I'm a lot of times I'm like, just do this for me. Every time a thought comes up about what you think you are or this limiting idea of yourself, just question it. And it's this whole mm-hmm. idea of, of unlearning. I think it is so much more powerful than trying to just like stuff more information inside of our yes. brains. So I, I really like that you brought that up. Yes. And just a point of, of it's almost hypocritical to try to assign any meaning beyond <laughs> like human language. If you do look at the Bible, if that's going to be your specific set of rules and practices, how dare you try to tell me, you know, in English that's been rummaged through Greek and Latin and thousands of years of different people and translations. First of all, I did study theology and I don't have it figured out. Most really smart theologians also don't have it figured out. And I think that's where wisdom comes from, because if you're going to sit here and say you're damned going to hell because you had an abortion, well, homie, your wife also wears gold earrings and that's not supposed to happen according to the Bible. So what, what's kind of the, what, what is your lens of righteousness here? Um, and then also what you were saying about unlearning, I think that, um, I've mentioned that I've been out of the country for the past couple of months and I very much went on a expedition of like trying to the cliche go like find yourself. And very, very soon after I got out of the West, out of America, I realized that it wasn't about finding myself. It was about losing the parts of me that weren't there to begin with. And And what is it? You guys probably know more than I do that it it is much more of an Eastern line of thinking when it comes to like art. It's not so much about adding, it's about taking away to like actually create the sculpture, the masterpiece that you are. And I, I think that like when it comes to your worth or your identity, it's really just becoming like, like we've said, like the least other people of yourself, you know, becoming, that's why I think that like inner child healing and like looking at like who you are before other pe- what other people told you to be is just so important if you want to be and i stray away from the word happy but if you want to be content i think that it's really really important to get away from the idea of needing to be happy all of the time just being just being not being happy or sad or whatever cuz all of those emotions change and you can go through any of them but um but yeah yeah really good point <laughs> That was well said. It's interesting because as a dad, my daughter's 15 now, but when she was growing up and she was very young, she had moments of, of just blissful clarity. Like she, she looked at me one day, she's like, are we in the world or on it? And it just made me think. I was like, that's a really good question. Hmm, Great I'm going to think about babe. that, right? And, but as she got a little older and it became you know, more about like, oh, this makes me happy and this makes me happy and this makes me happy. Those moments of clarity started to subside. And I, I know from other videos and discussions we've had before that this is part of ego development part of ego development is that that sense of lack is that sense of i need Mm -hmm. to fit in is that need for control and certainty and all of that but that that desire for the end result is always what takes us away from the ability to do something with where we are now and this is why children who are very young who aren't taught like always go for the thing that makes you happy they're not always given what they wanted 
right? Mm -hmm. Like when I was young, and admittedly I'm old, so it was the 80s, um, I would just sit in a field with a stick or, or a rock or something. Like it was just, it was just time on my own. My daughter's homeschooled, so she's had a lot of that time on her own as well. But that's what Jesus was saying. He's like, be like a child. Like, don't, don't be trying to get yeah. somewhere all the time. Be where you are. And our entire, everything in this world tells you quite the opposite. And that can go, I mean, that can go to, through the lens of like capitalism, consumerism of just like, you are never going to be satisfied. You are never going to be happy because you need this product. You need this, you need this, you need this. And then maybe you'll be happy. Um but in reality, there's no uh, there's no magic fix. And and also, as you were saying, like Jesus, there's a reason why he was so particular towards children is because kids are usually smarter than all of us. Or what's the phrase that dogs and babies see everything? And it's like, yeah, of course that they do, because they haven't been tainted with the, the all of the all of the things that we've been taught to look for instead of actually see things for what they are, because it's impossible to be present when you're somewhere else in your head, when you're rummaging through the past or you're anxious about the future. Um, or at least that's been my experience is that the best moments in my life are when I don't have my phone in my hand or when I, when I'm not planning something out, it's just like, why can't you just like be here and be grateful for this this moment that you're in and, and observe it rather than, you know, try to also trying to like dissect or assign meaning to, to things, um, is, is not a way to live either. In my, in my opinion, I'd say that's, that's a pretty good opinion in general. Um, <laughs> I'm going to pass this back to Andrew if, quickly, but I wanted to mention that that idea of living in time, we've discussed this a number of times, but because we think of ourselves as a narrative, because we tend to think of ourselves as the concept, instead of the reality, which is never mm. the concept. Mm. We immediately exist in time. As long as we're mm. a narrative, we have a before and an after, right? Mm. As long as we're a creation or as long as we're going somewhere, there's time. And so mm. it's very hard to be present and be someone. Mm -hmm. You have to let that someone go so you can be the moment that you are. Yeah, it's like, it's so many so many aspects of, of like whether it's society or religion, they're all pushing this narrative of, of lack, you know, of mm -hmm. you need, whether it's most religions are like, you need God's love in order to be whole and complete. You and yourself can never find peace. You can't find it within yourself. You need to go outside of yourself. Society telling us you need more, you need more, you need more, you need more of this, you need more of that. And so it's just reinforcing, like, no matter where you look anywhere, it's like, you need something outside of yourself. You within yourself are not enough. You can never be whole and complete on your own. You need something outside of yourself. So it, it puts us into a almost hypnotic state of desire. And as long as we're desiring, we're suffering. Like that's, that's what it comes down to. Like peace is just a lack of desire to be anything else, anything more than you are in, in every single moment, but that's not the narrative that we get pushed from a very young age. It's like, you have to fit in, you have to get good grades. You have to do this to get that, this to get that don't do that or else this will happen. Like run from the stick, chase the carrot, run from the stick, chase the carrot. And it's just mm -hmm. a, a perpetual state of desire for something outside of the experience that you're having in the moment. And yeah. so many people they go their entire lives on that, on that treadmill of fear and, and desire. And mm. the moment that you're in, no matter what experience you're having, like being there for it is jumping from that treadmill or that train track that, yeah. you know, 99.9% .9 of society is, is running on, but it's, it's tough with everything being pushed that we're told it's like from a very young age, that's how to, you know, be accepted and, and to make it quote unquote, make it in the world. And, and it's like, there's nothing you have to do to make it. It's just letting go of the idea of having to do anything at all mm -hmm. is, is really what it comes down to a lack of want, a lack of desire is, mm -hmm. is all it ever comes down to. Mm -hmm. And you find really quickly that whenever you decide to, I believe it's a, it's a Buddhist, uh, teaching that like, having the butterfly in your hand 
that like when you just let a butterfly come and go instead of gripping onto it and crushing it and killing it, that so much of so much more of your life, like blessings unfold, good things unfold, but also the bad things come and go too. And it's, it's all about how much meaning you assign to those good and bad things of just like, can this be a lesson or was this just a product of the universe of, you know, the butterfly effect or whatever. Um, but yeah, that, that's a, that's a really good point. It reminds me of something that you actually said in one of your TikToks that doing nothing is the elite version of doing something. <laughs> and I really, really enjoyed that because it's not that we're ever doing nothing, but there is a me doing something. And that me is the problem because that's the idea of me needing to do rather than just being the doing, right? Mm. Which again, goes back to what we were saying earlier about religion and, and, and words that are mistranslated or misinterpreted, right? Like uh, when Moses met God at Mount Sinai in, in mm -hmm. the Bible that I grew up with, it was, you know, I am that I am, right? But mm -hmm. in the original, it was the being, mm -hmm. just being, mm -hmm. that's it. Yeah. And that's funny that you bring that up. I actually think I got that from a monk. Uh, I was reading a book and, and a monk said that, but if, if, can you imagine the world that we could live in if we all learned to be human beings instead of human doings? And Ryan. if we, if we all just stopped trying to figure things out, it, it, I, I think that like the amount of stress and anxiety and like pushing would just diminish and this is me like being a complete hypocrite too, because I, I, it's something that I work on every single day. And I was having a conversation with someone who, who didn't grow up in our culture about um, narratives and about how, when we were little, we were taught a lot of the Disney narratives, a lot of the, the folklore and fairy tales. And, and they follow a really distinct plot line of just like, you are introduced uh, there's hardship that happens and then the happiness comes after you get through the hardship and you work for the happiness. That's not how life has to be. If you don't want it to be that way, the moment that you're in is allowed to be happy and you're allowed to continue to be happy. But whenever you put a format on your life or a format on a situation, it's almost like you're playing God. It, it's like, who do you think that you are that you get to assign when you can only be happy at the very, very end? And this was kind of through the lens of um, more like relationships and experiences, but this is, this is with everything you maybe like your relationship with yourself, like just because I'm happy with myself today, doesn't mean I'm going to die <laughs> or like that. It's like the very end. Um, and so I just think that we could live in so much more abundance if we looked at it that way. Yeah. And, and just like you said, basically so much of our suffering is based on our idea of the situation and how we think mm. it should be, or we, or we hope that it will be, or the way that we want it to be. And there was, I did, uh, I do like Q and A's on my Instagram sometimes. And someone asked about shyness, like I I'm having a tough time with shyness. I don't want to be shy. It's, it's creating a lot of suffering for me. And, you know, I, I talked about some, some things cause I went through that for a while and was like very reserved, uh, growing up and was able to sort of overcome that. And the first, but the first thing I always say is like the shyness itself is not causing you the suffering. It's the idea that there's something wrong with being shy. It's the idea that you shouldn't be shy and that resistance to the reality and you can let go of the label of shyness as well. Like there's no objective, you know, shyness. That's just an idea mm -hmm. that exists inside of your mind, but mm -hmm. it's, it's not actually the shyness that's making you, you know, uncomfortable or causing you the suffering. It's not the situation that you're experiencing. It's your thoughts about the situation that you're experiencing. Yep. It's your resistance to, it's your desire for it not to be, but it is, it is what is, you know, and it always is what is. And until you accept it and come to terms with it and realize that there's nothing actually wrong with it. Only then will you be able to take the next step and work towards, you know, like taking more action, realizing that, okay, this is happening now, but it doesn't have to happen forever. I can, you know, go to that event 
that I'm so afraid of going to, and then, you know, leave after a couple minutes, I can go and mm -hmm. say hi to one person. And if they don't say anything back, like that's fine, but that usually doesn't happen. They, they're usually like, Hey, mm -hmm. how's it going? You know, stuff like right. that. And, but it, it has to, the first step is always an acceptance of it. it. It's a lack of resistance to your desire for the situation to be any different because that's what's driving that suffering at the end of the day. Yeah. And learning that maybe the question is a little bit more important than the answer of, of where did I learn that being shy was wrong? Uh, because maybe I'm not wrong. Maybe whoever taught me that was from a broken system or they were taught by someone else that that was wrong or faulty or not allowed. But in also becoming really clear on like, oh, if I don't want to be shy or I don't want to be this or this or this, maybe figure out what you do want and giving yourself the permission of just like, maybe I can be that if I'd like to be. And, and that's kind of where I'm sure, you know, like confidence is built in like learning uh, more like self-accountability and things like that. But you know, I absolutely think that uh, I, I for sure think that too. That's awesome. And I'm going to tie that back to one more quote of yours that I wrote down, which was to find oh. success, you have to double your rate of failure which I really enjoyed. And I would even add and reduce the rate of self-judgment if you can, right? Because mm. there's no real failure. It's just a concept, mm -hmm. right? You can't succeed without little mistakes or failures along the way. So it's not a failure. It's just step one of success, right? Yeah. You just have to keep going. That, that's all it is. But as soon as I think about myself, as soon as I'm defining myself, there's where, where I get stuck in the trap of either trying to gain momentum by feeding that idea of myself or lose momentum by beating that idea of myself up. And I was saying this to, to a client the other day that whatever idea of yourself that you have that you're beating up isn't you. That's the worst mm. part about this is that you're beating up a fiction that you're not. If you were, you wouldn't be beating it up. You'd be too busy yeah. being that thing. Separate. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I find it very interesting that you already are talking about this like your pro okay so i've said this numerous times over the last three seasons i'm i've been at this a long time i've, I've been awake to not being what i think i am for about 20 years and over that 20 years i've watched people at various different levels just decide yeah i'm comfortable i'm done questioning this is who i am now and then the stagnation sets in the rigidity sets in the self-judgment sets in and everything else starts to degrade from there but somewhere in your mid twenties, there's this sweet spot where all of a sudden you're realizing everything you've ever been told is true. doesn't seem quite right. And you have this chance to start questioning because you haven't settled on an idea of yourself. And it's not to say it only happens in your mid twenties, but it's often the case. Like when I met Andrew, for example, you know, he was 26. He ran across my content from when I was 26 going through the same stuff. Right. So it's just a matter of, taking the, that responsibility and that accountability again for being the process, right? Mm -hmm. For not just saying, oh, okay, well, that's the right thing to do because they've said it is, even though mm -hmm. every one of them is unhappy. I always find that amazing. So on your journey, what do you find to be the most challenging part of this? The questioning yourself or trying to ex express the new insights that you found to people who aren't? Uh, well, if I can add a third, uh, Absolutely. I guess it's cumulatively all, all of both of them of finding or being around people that are also willing to continue learning and learning how to sift through, which I, I don't want to dehumanize anyone, but it's like how I think people find people. I think that that, but like you were saying that you and, and like you guys found each other. Uh, I don't think it was an accident by any means that you intersected at a perfect point in time and space that you related to one another. And over the past couple of months, I uh, lost a really good friend. She didn't die. It just became really, really evident that we were so incompatible in our healing journeys and like the way that we viewed the world that our relationship didn't make any sense to go further. And it's more about learning, unlearning and learning more and finding those people. And it's like, who can you hold on to? No one really. Cause at the end of the day, who's your best friend? You got you, you know? 
And uh, even with, uh, I think this was like an Abraham Hicks quote or a sound that I heard once of her speaking about like her and her spouse and how it's like, well, even when I do get married, it's like, you know, I like you real great. Uh, but at the end of the day, like I have me, like I'm, I'm married to me. And I actually used to wear like a ring on, on my, on my right hand, just as like a reminder of just like, I've got me at the end of the day. But I do also think that it's important. And, and like on a social science level too, it's really important to have a tribe and have people, but just like learning to accept and let go, accept and let go. Whoever wants to come can come. Whoever wants to go can go unless it's my dog and he's staying. So <laughs> that is totally that's, fair. That's, that's the one that I'd like to keep. <laughs> that, that makes sense. I just want to add quickly that I enjoyed what you said there about people find people. Mm-hmm. And it's true. It's, it's very much like oil and water. You, you gravitate towards those that are, that are similar to you or, or at the very least, they're, they're more likely to tolerate the changes that you're going through because they, they can relate to them. Um, I've noticed that there is a common theme in, mm. on this path to for a, a large amount of people. Not everybody. I mean, Andrew is a perfect example of this because Andrew has family and a support structure and a relatively stable history in, in his life. Whereas me, right from like six months, I was on my own, and everything after that was just you know on my own. There was no tribe. Mm. There was no support structure. There was, and it was the wanting that support structure that was causing me so much pain. Because I wasn't in the mentality where I could have really appreciated that support structure if they were authentic. I could have appreciated people who were manipulative because I was manipulative. I was lacking, right? And so there had to come to a point where I was able to go, right, I'm accountable for my lack. I'm accountable for the need that I perceive. And it was at that point that I stopped needing anything. And then all of a sudden, everybody I met became a potential part of that tribe because I wasn't looking for them. I wasn't trying to find them. I was being the kind of person that I I would hope to meet, Mm. right? And then suddenly there they were. I heard uh, not too long ago that whatever potential you see in someone else is actually in yourself. So like I know a lot of, and I can only speak on behalf of my experience, but like a lot of girls that I know that are that are like still single or like looking for a spouse tend to make checklists of like who they want, like in a future man or like husband or whatever. And I went back and looked at the old list that I had and I was like, I am my dream man. I am him. Oh my God. I don't, I don't need, I don't, I don't need anyone, you know? And it's like, well, kind of gen dog. Like I would, I would love to have like a partner in life and like a spouse and like whatever, but there is no fulfillment until you realize that you can, em, you can embody who you would like to attract as well. And, but that's also the oil and water thing is like healthy people have healthy relationships a healthy relationship takes two healthy people. And whenever there is an unhealthy person with a healthy person, it becomes really evident really quickly. And this isn't just romantically, this can also be in your family system. And that's when I think it gets really difficult is like whenever you are healing and it becomes really, really aware to everyone that you aren't like the rest of them anymore. Um, I don't even want to say that it's like a a black sheep thing. It's like, well, now I'm like a, I'm an otter. Like I'm not even a sheep any, like I'm a completely different thing. And learning how to navigate that is something I'm still navigating. So I don't know if I have much wisdom on that, but just figuring out, um, how much of yourself, what can you fulfill in yourself? Because like, you're freaking awesome. Like we are all a part of this really cool, interesting system. And like, why not play the role of yourself? Just play the role of yourself today. And if you want to change it tomorrow, change it. If you want to change it in five seconds, change it because you have the power to do that. Absolutely. Unless, unless you're clinging to the idea of yourself for that false sense of certainty, which so many of us do, but I, I love this conversation. The, and the idea that at the end of the day, I don't need anyone and I'll tell my family that I'll tell my friends that, and that's the only way to have truly authentic relationships. Because if you are in a relationship, whether it's a friendship, family, significant other partner, whatever, Mm -hmm. and you feel like you need them, 
you will act subconsciously or consciously in a manipulative mm -hmm. way to keep them around because you need them. So you're not actually really being yourself. You're being something you think they want to see because you derive your value, not from within yourself, but from having people in your life, from having a group of friends, from having a family that's close to you, from having a significant other. That's how you derive your value. So as long as your value is coming from the external, from those people, and you feel like you need them or, or you want them in order to feel valuable, that is not a want. That is a need because your value is derived from it. So you have to let go of deriving your value from anything outside of yourself and recognize that there's no way for your value to be wavering whatsoever. There is no up and down of your value. It's unwavering no matter what. So you don't mm -hmm. actually need anyone. And once you fully recognize that, you can be in super healthy relationships because they're not stemming from a manipulative sense of lack. And people don't like the word manipulative when I say that, when it's like, oh, I, I sometimes care what people think. And it's like, if you care what people think, you're going to act manipulatively because you are going to act in a way in which you hope that they like you. You're acting in a way, hoping to get something in return, be it their validation, their love, them liking you, their friendship, all of those things. And it's like, mm -hmm. it's rooted in mani manipulation. Anytime you're acting in a way that's rooted in lack, you will act in a manipulative way because of that. And it's fascinating, but it's not often talked about because people will say like, oh, there's nothing wrong with, you know, wanting to be in a relationship. And it's like, why aren't you looking at that? Why aren't you looking at why you think you really want to be in a relationship? What are you lacking within yourself mm -hmm. that makes you think that you need that. And I understand there's like sort of levels to that. There's some people mm -hmm. that I know that are like, I need to find someone. And they're like on the prowl mm -hmm. at all times, mm -hmm. like walking down the street, just like looking at everyone, like that could be my future wife. That could be my future husband or, you know, whatever it may be. Yeah. There's, there's definitely levels to it, but mm -hmm. it's interesting. I love this conversation because as long as you feel a need to have someone in your life, you will not be acting authentically. You will be acting in a way doing your best to keep them around, whether you know it or not. Yeah. Well, I almost think of, I think in terms of, of metaphor and how, like you were saying that, like, if you need something, you subconsciously create a, that need. So like a hole, right. If you need a hole to be filled, fulfilled, it's like you, you turn yourself from like a plate into a bowl and it's like, bowls need to bowls need to be filled. A plate is always going to be flat, right? Like you're always going to stay at an equilibrium and whenever you just like, don't allow yourself to sink into a bowl, I guess, and learning how to navigate of like, what's the difference between a want and a need? Because like, I would, you know, like I would really love a Nobel peace prize, or I would really love a sports car, or I would really love a spouse, or I would really love, you know, a hundred million dollars, whatever that is. It's like, oh, but wait, I don't actually need that. It would be nice. And it's just, it is absolutely insane how much my life has changed, at least since I've gotten consistent with, with speaking that life into myself of like, I don't really need it, but like, it would be nice. And it's just, it's insane how much better your life gets. Even if you don't actually get those things, it's more about the mindset shift of just like, I am good. And, you know, going back to like being an apprentice of Jesus that man had maybe one or two pair of clothes and was homeless. <laughs> and I have learned in, in the, you know, my past year of just, I've moved around a lot and I have not had a consistent home base and I've never been happier in my whole life of like not having, you know, not knowing where I was going to sleep that night or not knowing where I was going to get my next meal and not by any means am I, um, fetishizing homelessness or poverty or, or anything along, along those lines. Let me be clear about that. But when you can recognize that like your needs can be met when you let go, it's a really beautiful thing. And I also, like I said, I also know that this, this might be coming from a place of like privilege, uh, but it's, it's not like, uh, 
it's not like you can just like sit on the couch, you know, it's like, you know, work and, and things like that are, are necessary for means of living because we're humans that need air and water and food and sex and a couple of other things. So just like recognizing that things come easier when you're a channel of accepting rather than, rather than yearning for, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Well put. I'm going to share a story with you quickly, but um, I often think of us very much like a battery. Uh, We have Mm. just huge amounts of energy. And then whenever we perceive a lack or whenever we perceive a need, all of a sudden half of that energy is now going somewhere else. And so we keep cutting down the amount of energy that we need to clearly look at where we are because we're so distracted with all these extra things that are draining the energy out of us. And it's funny because you were saying that, you know, I don't want to fetishize homelessness. And I don't think you are necessarily as, as recognizing that hardship will often breed growth and change mm-hmm. and strength. And when I, a couple of years after I woke up and going back on, on the dating thing, I didn't want a relationship. I, I had been single for like three years. I was, I was good. I was, I was on track. I was balanced. I was enjoying my life. I didn't want anything. And then I ended up meeting the person who is now my wife and she just never left. Like we never tried to date. We just kept hanging out because it was organic. We weren't trying to get anywhere. When we first met, I said, I'm here for today. If that's not enough, it never will be. Mm. It has to be for today. And and 18 years later, we are still on that. It's Mm -hmm. still for today. Like there's no commitment to the future, despite the fact that we have a child, because Mm -hmm. it's the quality of today that sets the relationship. But back to the homeless thing. So a couple of years after I woke up, I was living in a city and it was just, I, I was still wrestling with all the need and the lack and the manipulation and all this stuff. And I was clear in myself, but it was frustrating me that I was still surrounded by it all. And so I left, I I told Melissa, I told my wife that, that I had to go. It's been fun. I I wish that we could be together, but uh, I'm selling all my shit and I'm going to go and move out to an Island and live in the bush in a shack that I built Mm -hmm. out of scraps. And so I did that and she came with me, but for eight months, it was very much total uncertainty. We didn't know where the food was coming from. We didn't know if there was shelter. Sometimes we didn't know what the weather was going to be like. We didn't know anything. And and every day we would marvel at just the weird circumstances that would suddenly happen to make sure something went well for us or to, to ensure that we got our, our daily bread as it Mm. were. Right. And that's really what it is, is that if you're aware, if you're clear, every moment has opportunity. But what kills us, and I know from when I was homeless, when I was a a younger teenager, I had no clarity Mm -hmm. because I was judging myself. I was living my narrative. I was was beating myself up for the person I thought I was. And because of that, I missed so many opportunities that would have made my life better. Yeah. And that, that really is it. It's not that, you know, homelessness is a death sentence by any means. So you can go somewhere from there. If you're able to stop judging your progress, if you're able to stop beating yourself up and actually see clearly what's in front of you, because that's where we make relationships. You know, um, I had a, a Kung Fu student once and he was asking, you know, I, I can't find a job. I, I, nobody wants to hire me. What do I do? So I said, volunteer somewhere. And he said, that doesn't make any sense. I'm like, just do it. You know, energy in, energy out. Just do it. Sure enough, he volunteered. Within a week, he was talking to somebody else who was volunteering who gave him a job. Mm. Because we don't know. Just go forward. Yeah. Well, and and I say this all I was actually talking with my mom earlier about this, about uh the the concept of manipulation and how whenever you do something to please something else, you are throwing off the equilibrium of the universe because when you aren't you, no one else can be themselves either. And so it's like, well, if you want to go volunteer somewhere. You definitely should. But if you suppress that because you think, oh, I need to go get a job and I need to do this and then I need to make money. And it's like, well, you're kind of throwing things off, babe. Like, why can't you just live in your authenticity, which is why I believe in healing so much and like being really honest and open about it, because not that I consider myself any sort of extraneous influence for anyone, but there are people that if they hadn't healed loudly and set out the example for me, I, I don't even know if I'd be alive today. And then there are also people that, that learned from things that I have said that I have, that that's why I just believe so much in, in sharing what, you know, and anti gatekeeping and being so open and honest about the tools and knowledge that you've learned along the way, because if you're not you, no one else can be themselves either. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's fascinating with, with synchronicities and 
sort of this whole recognition of, of aligning with the flow that, that we're talking about here. It's like, everything is always happening perfectly. And it's our idea of how we want things to happen, how we think things should happen, how we hope things will happen that gets in the way of it, that sort of throws off the equilibrium, as you said, Jenny, and, and takes away from the reality of what is happening. And that, I think, distortion that we are currently collectively experiencing as a society. We have all these ideas about the way we think things need to be, the way we think things should be. And I need this for me. And, and I need more of this for me because my sense of value is, is derived from everything outside of me. And I need to get more and get more and add more and add more and add more. And so as a collective, we can see it throwing off the the equilibrium of reality because we're caught up in fictions. We are mm -hmm. caught up in ideas, in narratives, in stories, not the least of which being the story of ourself, thinking that we are what yeah. we think we are, think, think, thinking that we are something inherently separate from reality, that we are something inherently separate from the universe, that I exist as something separate from you. And it's just concept. It's just idea. Any division we perceive is conceptual. It's caught up in those ideas. And those ideas always throw us off from the equilibrium of reality, mm -hmm. take us out of the flow. And we, as a collective society, I think are just experiencing a throwing off of equilibrium at, as mm -hmm. we speak, because we're so caught up in the way we think things should be and the way we want things to be. And, and our narratives and our ideas of ourself are all like just getting in the way of just what is. And as we let go of that and that need for more and that need to be something more than what we are, because we're caught up in the illusion that we are what we think we are, mm -hmm. we can let go as we can peel back those ideas, like things will get a lot clearer. We'll start to be able to see like what actually should be happening or needs to be done by us as just pieces of reality, as, as fragments of reality. It's, it's like, once we get all of those narratives out of the way, like naturally it will just arise from within us. Like we will be yeah. embodying the reality of, of what needs, I say needs with like tongue in cheek, like needs to be done for things to start, you know, balancing back out. Right. And being able, I think, to find that space within yourself and like really separating yourself. That's why I'm such an advocate for <laughs> yoga and meditation, which I'm sure people are like rolling their eyes, but I have, as much as I'm an advocate for prayer, I think that meditation is not the same thing as prayer. Um, I think that a prayer is more like a petition and meditation is more like a receiving and being able to be still and being able to say like, this is how I view the world outside of myself, you know, and not having the assignment of how things should be rather than just being the way that things already are. You know what I mean? I do. That's, that's actually, it's a good way of putting it. And myself, I, I gradually moved farther and farther away from prayer over my life, or, or rather, I guess the idea of prayer has changed. Um, growing up, prayer was always to, to God. Um, mm -hmm. as, as I've grown up and recognized that there is no Ray, um, I've recognized there is no God in, in that the idea of God is not God. Right. And the perception of myself is not myself. And so who am I talking to if not myself? Right. Mm. So there, it's just like anything. If I perceive a need to pray for, if I perceive a lack to pray about, I'm just creating that for myself. Right. It's like that, the expression, I would rather reign in hell than serve in heaven. Right. I'd rather think I have control and suffer for it than just let go. Right. And be one with everything. And, and, and so that's, that's very much something that's changed for me over time. And I still catch myself, but it's normally in moments of stress where I'll find myself almost petitioning to the universe. You know, how do I do this? And what do I do now? And then I go, Whoa, who am I talking to? And as soon as I do that, I have an insight of what I can do next. As soon as I take the responsibility as the universe, the solution presents itself. Whether I know it's the solution or not is a totally different story. Half the time I don't. I'm just like, I'm going to go this direction. And two weeks later, it turns out to be the thing that I thought I, I wasn't going to get. Mm -hmm. But it's mm -hmm. always like that. As soon as I'm out of the way, 
things just find their own equilibrium, as you were saying, right? Mm. But we interfere, we create the distortion with, with our, our perceived separation. As soon as we perceive ourselves to be separate, we're afraid. And everything we do is informed by that fear. And, you know, what, whatever container that you feel, whatever container works for you, I think the phrase is, uh, there's no one more disappointed than an atheist with no one to thank and no one sadder than a Christian with no one to be mad at. So it, it's, it, it's, it, like you said, it, it's all about the perception of being separate and recognizing. I, I personally feel what works for me is the recognition of um, you know, your body and like where I feel things and where I think things in, in, in terms of like my physical body, but then also recognizing this is, this body's only here for a good 80 years. Like this is a 1996 model that's going to run out eventually. And the, you know, that the concept of time is a completely different conversation, but I do think that it is really important to to be able to recognize of like, who am I speaking to? And also how many voices are going on up here? Because like I have, and a lot of people that I know have, you know, suffered from the relics of an inner critic and like someone that's always pushing down on you or making you feel bad or telling you that you should be something that you aren't. And like really stripping that down and being like, actually is who I am okay? Like is, is who I am actually better than okay. Like who I am is actually love and who I was taught to believe my higher power already is. Yeah, absolutely. And, and with the, with the inner critic, cause that's something I dealt with for a very long time. And I had all of these ideas about who I was and what I was and what mostly what I was bad at <laughs> was what it came down to. And it, it's like the day that I questioned those things, the day I was able to see myself from sort of like a third person perspective, I was able to watch a recording of myself speaking with, you know, it was clients at work. And I had all these ideas that our boss had us record a client call these ideas about, I've mentioned this on the podcast before, but of how I was, how I was not very confident, couldn't speak very well, wasn't articulate, couldn't answer all the questions that clients had. I had all of these beliefs and I had never really seen it in action. They were just existing inside of my head. And I had this idea that like the call didn't go very well. And then I listened to it back and it went super well. Like there was all of these things, like it was totally a false reality that I was perceiving inside of my head. And the day that I saw that, I was like, oh my God, none of those are actually the truth. And that was like a week before I started posting content because I knew I wanted to for a while, but all of those things were stopping me from that. So when it comes to that inner critic you're mentioning, it's like question, 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 all of the things you believe to be the truth about who you are, what you are, what a reality is a constant state of questioning because everything is always in flux. Everything is always uncertain. Everything beyond this moment right now, is completely uncertain. It all is. That's our reality is uncertainty. We are uncertainty manifest. We are change. We are process. There is nothing certain about the fabric, the fabric of reality of what we are. So you have to exist in a state of questioning at all times or else, you know, if you're settling on answers, then you'll have something to defend. And the moment it's, you know, an answer, it's, it's questionable. And there's yeah. aspects of it that are not going to be the truth because answers are, are never the truth. Like words are never the truth of, of what it is. They can be pointers here and there, but you know, they're never going to be what it is. So with the inner critic, it's just so important any idea that comes up about what you think you are, whether it's good or bad, uh, just mm. question it and and become comfortable with being in that state of uncertainty is the best advice I can usually ever give people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it becomes, it, I mean, like you were saying, it becomes finite and it becomes solid ground. And whenever you're standing on solid ground that you can't fully defend or like because a lot of people look at like the Bible is like fully the truth or whatever religious practice that they believe is like fully the truth. And I think that's kind of when it becomes dangerous. If also, you are claiming that uh, like, oh, you shouldn't question. You shouldn't. Uh, you should just go. You should be blind to this one way of thinking. It's kind of like, so you think this all powerful God can't handle your questions? That that kind of sounds like a problem in of itself, babe. <laughs> 
well said for sure. It's funny because I was I was thinking about something you had said earlier regarding religion and and the unfortunate role of men in perpetuating that that particular that particular toxicity. And it's interesting to me because if, if you look at the history of, of Christianity and all that, not all men were really in favor of the church. I mean, most of the people who actually understood what the hell Jesus was talking about weren't in favor of the church. The, the original followers of mm-hmm. Jesus, the Gnostics didn't mm-hmm. form churches, right? They used to just get together and, and, and shoot the breeze. And then various saints throughout the times, mm-hmm. you know, they've done the same thing, but it's always the egotistical men that run mm-hmm. a structure. And I think that the reason for that is because they get so focused on how it identifies them and gives them that sense of control and certainty and Identity. power and all of that other stuff that they just get caught up in it. And the reason that women aren't accepted or women aren't appreciated in those circles is because they will tend to go, but this doesn't feel good, Mm. right? Like you're all caught up doing this. I'm not feeling connected to God, right? Like there's an element of where's the reality and how this feels in my body as opposed Mm -hmm. to up here cerebrally. And I just find it funny that every structure that is dependent on feeling that control generally doesn't have a lot of women involved unless they're very egotistical women. And this is something that Andrew and I have been talking about, and I'm I'm still trying to figure out a way to to approach this on on social media, because we talk about racism and we talk about misogyny and we talk, we talk about the colonizer mentality and, and, and white supremacy and all of this. And it's so very easy to look at those and go, those are problems and they are, but they're not the root of the problem. Mm -hmm. They're the result of the problem. The root of the problem is our idea of ourself taken as truth, right? As soon as I identify with my skin color, that's it. The game's over. Okay. Now I have to defend that as being the source of my value. That's the problem. And so it doesn't do us any good to say white people are this or men are this because it's a certain type of white person. It's a certain type of man. It's not even a certain type of white person. It's a certain type of person because God knows white people weren't the first ones to go colonizing around the world, right? We have a long mm-hmm. history. I mean, Rome colonized Europe. So you got to consider the colonizers were colonized. So you talk about generational trauma or hurt people causing hurt to other people, right? It's, it's just a huge train of egotistical toxicity where we've been abusing each other and then wondering why we're still hurting one another. Mm, yeah. Yeah. That's so good. That kind of peaks the, uh, the quote, I love, I love, uh, studying saints and I love studying, uh, religious figures, but like I said, I don't necessarily identify with one specific denomination. One of my favorite, uh, saints is St. Francis of Assisi. And he has, has a quote that goes, uh, preach the gospel at all times and when necessary use words. And I just think that it's so applicable to not even religion, just the way that you live your life of just like when it's necessary, say what you need to say, but otherwise exist in the essence of your being and your beliefs and other people will follow. And it's also funny because St. Francis was known to to really uplift women. And he had an an entire monastery dedicated to women, um, which failed uh, because of other men. So yeah, yeah. Shocking. (laughs) But like that was, that was in, that was in Europe. That wasn't even, you know, an American, you know, thing. So yeah, I think that it's a really important conversation and I appreciate you guys having that because as, you know, two white men in America, it's it's pretty easy to just sweep those things under the rug or act like you have all of the answers when really, like we've said, the questions are just a lot more important questioning the answers that have been continually spoon fed to us. The answer will never be as important as the continued process of questioning. Love, love that one. But yeah, with when it comes to it, I loved that quote. That was fucking awesome because that's what we talk about all the time. Like, you don't have to go around trying to change everyone else, trying to change the world when you recognize that you are the world. You are seamlessly interconnected as the world itself. You are reality. You are, you know, the United States of America. You're it. So, embodying it, being that change you want to see is all you ever have to do. And I have found in my life that that's significantly more impactful, you know, being that just expressing it, not forcing it on people because people start to ask questions. They're like, wow, you seem pretty chill and like free and not tied down, weighed down by all this stuff. Like what's going on? It's like, well, I've, I've been letting go of the idea of myself more and more all the time and not trying to do too much 
about it externally, not trying to get anywhere necessarily, but it just comes down to embodying, to being that mm. change you want to see is enough when you see that you're it, you want to mm. change the world, be that which you want to change because that's all you ever have to do. You don't have to go outside of yourself. And it's, it's freeing in a sense to recognize that. And then from that state, as people, you know, come together, being that change, change is made, waves are made. And, yeah. and that's where the yeah. significant growth happens, but it's not from this like tyrannical dictator, like egotistical, like I'm forcing these people to change because they have to, because I know what's best for them and they don't know what's best for them. It's like just being that change. That's that sort of, that sort of progress is, has always been the most impactful in my experience and in what I've seen in reality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've been, uh, kind of trying to dissect this idea that I've had of what is the opposite of orbit? Like, what is the opposite of like a helicopter of like patrolling someone else and like patrolling what you think they should be, whether that's in terms of government, whether that's in terms of relationships, whether that's in terms of religion, career, whatever that is, and how can we achieve that type of, I don't even, I don't, I don't love the word detachment, but how can we achieve that type of being almost, uh, just, just at equal, just at, you know, zero at none, uh, rather than trying to like tell people what to do or allowing other people to tell us what to do. And I'm still, I'm still chewing on that and deciphering through it, but it seems like you guys have, uh, have a lot of conversations about this on here. <laughs> it's, it's a tricky one. It's something that I've wrestled with for a long time because when I first woke up, I was extremely vocal. I, I, I was coming out of hell. I was coming out of a decade of suicide ideation and, and depression and hell. And, and suddenly there was this doorway and everything just opened up. I was like, oh my God, I'm free. I need to tell everyone about my freedom. And that wasn't well received uh, by any means. And then over time, I, I started realizing it really is just about embodying it because you can't mm -hmm. teach being. Mm -hmm. You can only be, mm -hmm. right? As soon as you're teaching, you're no longer being. You're, you're trying to get somewhere again. You're trying to, to influence the flow. And so it really is just about, you know, being the ripple in yourself, being a light onto yourself as, as Krishnamurti mm -hmm. used to say. Right. And so mm -hmm. after 20 years of doing that, and, and I shut up for like 10 years, I, I just stopped. And you had a guest on your podcast recently. I can't remember her name. I do apologize, but she had said something along the same lines that mm -hmm. suddenly there came a point where it's like, I have to apply this. It's not about telling anybody. It's not about convincing anybody. It's about me internalizing it. Well, I did that for about 10 years. I just mm -hmm. got out of, out of the conversation. And when I came back, I realized that how I approached the conversation had changed. All of a sudden, it, it wasn't me trying to wake anybody else up. It was me just trying to be clear in myself. So that way, if they're with me, I know they're safe. And if they're safe, they'll probably relax a little bit. And as soon as they do, their hell diminishes. And that was it. It was just being the kind of person people could be themselves around because nobody else is, right? Everybody wants them to be something. Everybody's looking for something out of them unconsciously still, right? But it's there. And so we're always on guard. We're always looking for those strings. We're always, you know, walking around on eggshells. And I think the very best thing that we can do for ourselves, for the world, for, for approaching that, uh, that world that you were imagining earlier where there's just less division. I think it's just about seeing less division in ourselves and then giving it the time to ripple outwards, right? And that's what I've been lucky enough to see in the 20 years that I've been doing this. And it's been 20 years and I'm just having this conversation now. I'm just doing this podcast now. The community that we've built on Discord is at 400 members now. Where were you guys 20 years ago, right? It wasn't a, a conversation that was even, it wasn't entertained, let alone, you know, openly welcomed. Now as a result of all of the consequence and as a result of all of the distortion that we created for ourselves, we are having the most sane conversation in the room by saying that we're God or that saying we're the universe or that we're all one. It's no longer a religious concept. Now we're talking about how it's the reality when you stop thinking about yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just, I, I find that and, to be inspiring. Yeah. And it, what you were saying kind of uh, reminds me of 
the serenity prayer, which is, which is often used in like the Alcoholics Anonymous programs and all of the anonymous programs, uh, even by people that don't, you know, uh, affiliate with any religion. And I think it just comes down to, uh, recognizing that you have zero power and all of the power at the exact same time. And you can figure that out however you want to figure that out, but it's more like accepting those truths and being like, I have so much power to change the world and I have absolutely none of it. So what do I do with this now? That's awesome. And I just wanted to say that what you just stumbled across there was the very reason that our, our podcast is called Dualistic Unity, because we have both spectrums and it makes one thing, us, mm. right? Life is duality, but it's unity expressed as duality. We're all one. We just perceive division. So I, I just want to say again, I'm, I'm very, very happy that you joined us for today's episode. I think that this conversation is going to be very well received among our, our audience and our, our members because we're all struggling with this. I had a conversation with a client the other day and uh, I, I put it, I, I answered her question in a way that wasn't very appreciated because of the way it sounded, kind of like the way the word manipulation sounds negative when you come at it from a certain way. And I basically just said, well, the problem is you keep thinking about yourself. Is there any way you can change how you've worded that? I really don't like how that sounds. And my answer was no, because it's the distaste for how that sounds that you have to get past to let it go. <laughs> like you have to take the hit to your ego in order to yeah. let that ego go. Yeah, that's happened to me before. I don't know if it's a, I don't want to assign it to like a gender thing, but I had someone tell me years ago um, that I was insecure and I was, I was absolutely insecure about whatever we were talking about in that conversation. And it hurt my feelings so badly. And I was like, you need to apologize for that. And he was like, no. <laughs> And it was so important, like I said, it's so important back then before I went on this journey of, of self-discovery and, and, uh, and healing to like hear that from someone and recognize that whatever someone says to you, it can always be a learning opportunity, even if it is false, you know, even if it is a projection, even if it is something that isn't accurate to that, that specific situation learning how to let go of your ego is a daily practice, you know, and, and just recognizing that you don't need to identify with any type of label, good or bad. You know, I didn't know that about dual, like that, that was the name of this podcast. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. No, letting go is, is moment to moment, every single moment. And I, you know, I get caught up in the illusion of division all the time and thinking that I am what I think I am, but I did want to go back to the point of, you know, the, the both ends of the spectrum, like you have all the power and no power simultaneously. And the way I thought of that when, when you said it was influence versus control and that sort of mm -hmm. idea. So like in the sense that you have no control or no power of control, which is always in the future, you know, the outcome, how it's going to turn out, but you have all the power here and now, which is influence, but we're so caught up in the idea of having control and desiring control and wanting to get control because that gives us a sense of certainty. And our biggest fear collectively is being in a state of uncertainty that it almost doesn't allow us to see all of the power, the infinite potential power that we have in the moment to have influence over the situation because we're so caught up in the idea of control that we think we have, no, or we, we are, have this false sense of illusion of power of control that isn't actually real, not realizing that if we let go of that desire for control, that need to control the outcome, that that's where all the power actually lies, but it's mm -hmm. only through the influence of the moment. So I just, mm -hmm. I just found that interesting, that, that little connection there. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes, at least in my experience, it hasn't been until all of that control is taken away, uh, that you can actually get a little bit of clarity on like, I didn't actually have control at all. It, that was all an illusion that was made up in my head because I, I think about uh, a, a couple of weeks ago, I had gotten off a plane and I didn't have a ticket booked for the next train to get out of the, the, out of the airport. And it was like, 
oh, I need to get a train ticket. I need to figure out how I'm going to get out. I need to find another means of transportation. And then when you actually get out of the airplane, you can just like kind of figure out where you're going after. And it's like, why do we keep trying to cross bridges before we get to them? I had dinner with a new friend uh, and <laughs> he's someone who lives pretty nomadically. And he, uh, I was talking about, don't, don't you ever, don't you ever feel unstable? Like when you don't have a plan, don't you ever feel like you need to plan things out and have some control? And he said, you know what? No one builds houses on bridges and isn't life just like one big bridge after another. So fair, you know, like you don't need to have any sort of consistent control and clarity and plan all of the time. When you could, there could be a meteor coming and you could die within the next five minutes. So letting go of that kind of control and the narrative that you try to create for yourself or whatever situation it is, is actually just kind of, it's egotistical and um, it's actually just not very productive. (laughs) No, but it definitely makes me feel better if I lack faith in myself. Mm. If I don't have any faith in my ability to adapt, I need some sense uh, that I know what's coming and that I know what my response to that's going to be. But it's always based on my idea of myself. So I'm always in a, in a smaller and smaller box. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and it always has a cost. It's the Midas touch story. Right. Mm. Does anybody know the Midas touch story or King Midas? Basically, he was the yeah. richest guy in the land and he, it wasn't enough for him. He wanted to be able to turn everything that, that he, he saw into gold. And so at first, this was great. Ding, gold, ding, gold, ding. Oh, come here, honey, for a hug. And all of a sudden, his family turns to gold. He goes to eat something. It turns to gold. So he can't, it just keeps taking away from his life over and over and over and over again, right? But power is the exact same thing because we get caught in that idea of ourself again. Like, this is what's going to make me happy, right? Instead of, this is what I'm using to soothe the lack. Yeah. And when when you can recognize of like, it's, a, I think relationships or career in, in the West for sure is a, is a really good example of that, of just like, uh, I believe on like, like a, a research level that like fame and like success is the one thing that the more of it you get, the less happy you are. Um, and I would argue that with a lot of different, a lot of different things. It's like, you think that the, the white picket fence is going to make you happy. You think that like, the having the certain amount of money in your bank account is going to make you happy or the ring on your hand is going to make you happy when, when it's the ideas of those things that are already making you happy of just like, Oh, maybe I can achieve that one day. The achievement idea is better than the actual receiving of it. I promise you. Uh, I know because I have, I have lost and received so many things that it's like, I didn't even know that I wanted this. This was better after I have let go of whatever idea I thought that I wanted was when the, the, the plan of the universe or the plan of, of the betterment of all of us comes into play and things just work out better that way. Also, I'm less tired. (laughs) It's like, stop, stop trying to control everything all of the time because you're like, you were saying the battery, it's just like, you only have so much to give and you might as well just you might as well just be chilling if you can just be, don't do all of the time. Um, which our, our culture is, is really, really bad at that. I will say. <laughs> I will agree with that. If you ever have a chance, I don't know if either of you have ever had uh, the opportunity to go and watch one of these shows live, but I know you can find it on YouTube. Look up spinning plates. If there spinning is plates. spinning plates, if there's ever an example of how it feels to be juggling too many wants and desires at the same time, it's somebody spinning plates. Basically, they have a bunch of sticks in a row and they get the stick wobbling and they put a plate at the top. So it's spinning. And while that one's spinning, they try and get all the sticks with plates at the top and keep them spinning at the same time. And it looks just like chaos by the end of it because he's just j- jumping back and forth to keep all these plates from falling down. And that's exactly the mentality that we get into when we think we need control over our lives. This is a mentality that at one point almost killed me. I was having heart problems at 19 years old. I was getting to the point where I was so anxious, I was blacking out. Mm. And it was because I was never enough. I was always, I always had to make sure I was perfect. I always had to make sure that everything I did, everything I said was exactly the right way because my happiness was dependent on it. So it was right. There was a lot riding on me doing the right thing. Mm-hmm. Right, never realizing that it wasn't about what I did. It was about the mentality I did it in. 
right? It wasn't about having control. It was about being able to adapt with whatever happened, right? And ever since then, yeah, all of a sudden you do find yourself with a lot more energy. All of a sudden you do find yourself with more space for insight because you're not taking up all that energy, just thinking about things that don't exist. And I think you're absolutely right. It, it did help to be lazy because, because I am. Yeah. Yeah. Which it, it's so, so difficult. I mean, I'm still a part of the the machine that I was raised in and, and I'm trying to unbecome that and become the purest form of, of, who I think that Jenny should exist as today in this world, but learning to say like the really, really lame TikTok sound of just like, I don't chase, I attract like whatever is meant for me will simply find me. And it's like, God, that sounds so lazy. I don't want to do that. And it's like, wait, actually, like I can only do what I can do. And there's a reason why that I, why that is. I had a doctor tell me last year I could have broke his neck he looked at me in the face and, and I was having, I was having problems with my health, obviously. And I was kind of coming up with like, Oh, why do this to help and this to help? And I've been on this medication and this, this, this. And he looked me in the eyes and he said, I don't know if anyone's ever told you this, but, uh, you're not superwoman. You can't keep doing, if you keep doing, you're not going to get any better. And I think that's applicable to everything. It's just like, how asking yourself the question, how easy can I make this? How, how, what is the bare minimum effort that I can give to get what needs to happen to happen? It's so hard. It's so hard. <laughs> get the maximum milk for the minimum amount of move. Yeah. Precisely. <laughs> yeah. It's fascinating how exhausting our idea of ourself is. And any, mm-hmm. any time we're desiring, any time we're doing, it's through the lens of our idea of ourself, of our opinion, of what we think we should be doing. And to quote Ray from one of his videos from Discover Transcendence, it's a lot about this idea of, of you know, when it comes to happiness and getting what you want, we think that when we get what we want, we're happy because we got the thing. But the reality is that we're happy because we stopped wanting even if it was just temporarily. So could it be that, you know, the, the key to happiness is just not wanting, not wanting anything other than what you're experiencing right now, what you are right now, where you're at right now, and that just fully accepting whatever you're doing, whatever you're, wherever you are, not desiring anything other is where peace lies, is where you know, happiness lies is just an acceptance, a lack of desire. There is nothing Mm -hmm. outside of you that, that gives that to you. It's, it's Mm -hmm. just the lack of what you think you want, what you think should be. And it's not just like, you know, getting material things, it's getting to a state of peace, getting to a state of clarity. Even that is another desire. And that will keep you from embodying that state of peace that only comes when you stop wanting to be or do and, or become anything other than what you are in in the moment that you're experiencing every single moment. Mm. So yeah, it's one of my, one of my favorite quotes is like key to happiness is not wanting. That's what it comes down to anything other than, than what you are. Mm -hmm. I want to toss a caveat in there quickly, just because I know from watching uh, Jenny's content that there was an episode on getting what you want. Actually, I, I was I was really enjoying that episode and because as with all language, the trick is that we're using words that have different meanings to us, right? Want may mean one thing to one person and mean something to another person entirely. Like sometimes want and need to a person are synonymous. They don't see the difference. If I want it, I need it. That's pretty much it. It's going to make me happy. Therefore, that's a, that's a need. It's like it's not. It's a perceived need. Maybe, right? What we really need is, is like food, water, shelter, that kind of thing, right? But th- there's wants. And, and so is it bad to want things? No, not at all. I want to go to the store. I'm going to go to the store. Do I need to go to the store? Eh, maybe not, right? Am I, is my life going to be worse off if I can't get to the store today? Well, I can always go tomorrow, right? Or I can find another store. How much am I committed to that end result? Right. And that's really the only danger in picking a direction. Otherwise, we're just a limitless being picking a direction and opportunities to express our limitlessness. Mm-hmm. But as long as we're feeling whack, trying to get somewhere where now we're whole, that's what gets in our way each and every time. But if we're whole, every direction is fulfilling. 
nothing is promising fulfillment. Yeah. Yeah. That's so good. And I, uh, this, the thing is, is you learn the, the more that you let go, the more that you learn, oh, whatever was meant for me is actually going to happen. If I just allow it to happen and I stop fighting so hard and I stop gripping so hard onto the ideas of what I think is going to make me happy or what it is. I think that I want what, and what's the song, you know, you might just find sometimes like you get what you need and whatever it is that, that you need is going to be implemented into your existence. However, however, uh, the universe decides that day, I think it's the, I'm trying to think where I, I learned this or read this. Um, have you guys read steal like an artist? Um, it's, it's like a really, a really quick read, but one of, one of the practices in it is the, the teaching of that the universe finds channels for everything. And if you have an idea and you don't express that idea, the universe is going to find someone else who is willing to at whatever moment that is. So it's like stealing artwork or copying artwork or whatever it is, whether that's, you know, music or writing or whatever. It's like, well, if you have an idea, babe, like you better write it down because otherwise the universe is going to find someone else to do it. And it's like, do you want to be the next? I'm sure that someone at some point had the idea of Harry Potter, but JK Rowling was the one who decided to do it um, because she was, she was ready and open to receive that idea in whatever it was that was supposed to happen from that story. So it's just like, well, and I'm not saying by any means that J.K. Rowling was lazy or just waiting around for an idea, but she was willing to to put it out there at whatever time it was given to her, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll pass this back to Ray, but I just had a, a sort of way that I was thinking of this like graphically in my, in my head. And I was actually thinking about this. Funny how that you know works out this past week. Um, you know, like those rubber balls that are i don't know in like kids stores and they have little spiky things yeah. at the end i kind of saw like reality as that like that's reality and the prickles are all just like people or just like fragments of awareness and your idea of, of ideas they're kind of like in the ball and they're they're bouncing around and ray has said in the past that you know his insights he doesn't he doesn't take credit for them because he doesn't know where they come from because there's just nothing getting in the way of, of him embodying them or, or, or expressing them. They're just being expressed. You know, when, when we talk on this podcast, oftentimes I have no idea what we talk about by the end. Cause it's just like flowing through. We're kind of like in the flow of it, not judging how it's happening or, or what's being said or how it might be perceived by the audience. You know, we're just, we're just in it. We're just doing it. So I was thinking of like the, like inventions are like bouncing around potential things and like, as you know, us as the universe and just reality kind of works its way out, finds that equilibrium. There's like, you know, potential inventions that it's like, oh, this is something that would be beneficial for us right now. Like even the idea of the internet is something that kind of allows us to not congregate in such close quarters anymore for, you know, whether it's work or living so closely together, obviously I fucking live in Manhattan. So like I'm kind of the, the physical embodiment of, of the, what the internet maybe was trying to help with. Um, but the idea like the internet is to help like spread the globe or, you know, even something like Bitcoin potentially is something that can help spread energy around the globe. And for anyone who's like looked into a lot of that, like there's a lot of potential for that. So anyway, there's like that idea bouncing around within this rubber ball. And it's like looking for ways out, looking for the the spikes to kind of come through. And it's like, you know, gets to one and that person's not ready. They're, they're too caught up in not recognizing that they're the spike. They think they're just a spike. So then they can't sort of that idea can't get through. But the more you let go of thinking you're just the spike and recognize you're the whole ball, those ideas come through. And so like that idea of just, I'm just settling on this, like of the invention of the internet is like, maybe it, there was a couple spikes that just weren't ready for it. And finally it found one that it came through. And that's, I don't know what the, their name was who invented it or what group of people, but like, that's how I sort of pictured what you were just talking about it was just like ideas, insights, inventions are all bouncing around in there, just trying to find a way out. And those open to receiving it 
usually are the ones who, who do those who don't have an idea of, of the way things should be or what, what their path should look like oftentimes are the ones that it's able to, to flow through. Nice. Yeah. Nicely said. I just want to comment on this quickly because it's funny. There was a, there was a gentleman in the 1920s, I think it was, who was talking about technology as it was, as it was coming into being. And he was saying one day people are going to be walking around with a window that's going to have a screen and the ability to contact other people through video rather than telephone. And this was in the 1920s talking about the possibility of a tablet coming into being, right? So it's like Jesus was saying, right? There's nothing new under the sun. Like everything that could possibly exist within our awareness is in, inside our awareness. What we lack is the context. What we lack is the, is the right environment. It's kind of like walking through a house. You're upstairs wondering where the kitchen utensils are. It's like, well, they're in the kitchen. So you have to go near the kitchen, right? Well, the same is true for insights. Until we're at a certain situation or a certain uh, relationship with the rest of ourselves as reality, certain insights don't pop up because they can't. Like the Salem witch trials. They killed those people without listening to them. They called them witches and, and forced them to ad admit that they were working with the devil. Look at the Spanish Inqu Inquisition. Same thing. All you had to do was be suspected. And that was a sentence in itself. So we couldn't talk. We couldn't bring up insights because the environment wouldn't let us. Right now we're at a point where those insights can come up. So I, I think us coming to insights, us finding the insights that reveal even greater types of technology or greater types of governance or greater types of economics or, or, or uh, greater ways to work with the environment. All of these require us to get out of the way so those insights can manifest because right now we're standing in their way. It's interesting. And I think for, for me, for that, when we grapple with those sorts of questions or like, it's easy to get caught up and flustered and like, oh my God, like everything's so fucked. Like, what are we going to do? And it's like, well, you know, look around. What can you do? Be, embody, be that change you want to see. From there, ripples are going to be made. You're going to have an impact that is so powerful and drastic and infinite and eternal that you don't even recognize. Smiling at one person on the street can ripple and echo in eternity. Like you actually have no idea the impact that we have on every single moment, both within and without. It comes from within. Change comes from within and spreads from there naturally, always. It doesn't have to go from without. We don't have to change the external because we are the external no differently than anything that we perceive as the external is. <laughs> That's awesome. So on that note, as we are approaching the hour and 45 minute mark, which often happens on our episodes, we do talk for a long time because as we've been communicating throughout this entire conversation, the conversation really is the solution that we're looking for. It's not any one thing that's the solution. It's the state of awareness that comes with talking about this, with, with grappling with the challenge of getting out of our own way in a world that's built on the idea of ourselves. And, and that's why we were so very grateful that you joined us for this episode, because you are quite clearly on that path. Like All of your content authentically communicates that you're just trying to figure out how to get out of your own way, right? And you're trying to share what you've learned. That's the solution. You're the solution. Anybody who's on the same path is the solution. And we always end up on that path when we question ourselves. The only question is how we get to that point where we question ourselves. For me, it was hitting rock bottom numerous, numerous times. For other people, it's, it's they just decide, I'm done. I'm done suffering. I'm done doing what everything, everybody else tells me I should be doing. And so... I'm inspired. I'm inspired by creators like you, Jenny, who are out there sharing your journeys and, and really just pushing the envelope. Like, I love your podcast. I love the fact that, that you write and that you're trying to get published. Like you, you have momentum and enthusiasm for your path as a whole. And if everybody had that, the world would change in, in a very short period of time. And so that's what this is all about. And I'm very glad that you joined us. Now, before we let you go, um, I would like to ask, are there any tips or, or tricks or insights that, that you find that you rely on day to day going through challenges or when dealing with self doubt that you would like to share with our audience before we part ways? Uh, yeah. I mean, I think that first of all, very kind words. I, I really appreciate those. And I co-sign for sure that if, that if we all just keep, uh, just keep trying and, and stop gatekeeping things from one another and, and being honest, I, I don't think that there's any reason to keep secrets 
about anything anymore. So it, however I can help, you can help, we can help each other always, always just try to try to be of service. Uh, but in, in terms of, of practices and, and mindsets that I try to keep, um, I, I really try to remind myself every day, uh, whenever, you know, the inner critic comes in or I start to, um, become really, you know, the existentialism or, you know, whatever starts to play in my head of just kind of like, instead of asking what the worst can happen, asking myself, what's the best that can happen and, and really detaching myself from any type of outcome. So, so if you, if you, um, if you if you also find yourself doing that or have struggled with any sort of mental ailments or or cages, uh, another thing that really helps me a lot is uh, there's a quote <laughs> that uh, I try to remind myself of of that when you're in your head, you're dead. So trying to get out of your head, trying whether that's going for a walk, whether that's helping someone else, and like really becoming unself interested all of the time. I can promise you that that whenever you are out of your head, into your body, into helping someone else, that uh, I've never regretted getting out of here because this can be, we've been in here for an hour and 45 minutes and, and there is always time. There's always time to do that. But I think that I had read, um, I don't know if you guys are a fan of Ryan Holiday and Sto like the Daily Stoic. Um, but I, I love learning about stoicism and, and philosophy and philosophers, but, um, yeah, something that he was talking about was that there's a, there is a time for everything and you can't mull all of the time. You can't think all of the time. Sometimes you can go bake a cake or like you can go volunteer at a homeless shelter. Sometimes you can go for a walk with your dog. So when all else fails, uh, try, try to do something really, really simple and out of, out of your head. So I think that answers your question. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's all a meditation. I like to think of it and it's all opportunity to let go of your assumptions of the way you mm -hmm. think it should be, or the way you think it should go, or the way you think you should be. So mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely love that. And really appreciate you joining us. This is a very, yes. very enjoyable conversation. Absolutely love your content. Love the podcast. Yeah. Appreciate you being you and expressing all of that for, for everyone. It's a great example for the potential of, of what's, you know, what's possible when, when we question, when we let go and when we align with the flow, I didn't yeah. mean to rhyme that, but yeah, I, <laughs> I definitely appreciate the, the time you gave us today, Jenny. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you guys for, like I said, having these conversations, they're important. I agree. I haven't stopped talking about them for 20 years. I don't know if I even can at this point, it's just what I do. I mean, when I'm not talking about it verbally, I'm talking about it through everything I do. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're going to wrap up the episode here. I want to remind everybody, of course, that there are still some tickets available for our upcoming uh, retreat in November on Vancouver Island. It's going to be eight days in a 4,500 plus square foot house. We've got a heated pool, a uh, billiards table. You're going to be hanging with Andrew and I. So you're going to be able to talk about anything you want for the entire time that you're there. There's some provincial parks. It's going to be gorgeous. So if you can, if you can join us, definitely uh, do so. The tickets are at dualisticunity.com. We would love to see you there. Um, Jenny, again, thank you so much for joining us. We will see everybody next week for episode six. Thanks, everyone. Hi, everyone.